Hey everyone. Hey everyone. Hey everyone. This one's gonna be rough. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie, a former professional MCAT tutor and a current medical student. Today we're going to be walking through the bio biochem passage four in the new AAMC free practice exam. So let's get straight into it. So of course we're going to start by reading the passage and flow charting. I always like to look and see if there's a title though, and there's not. I love when that happens. So the passage starts out, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are drugs that can alleviate symptoms of depression by blocking the reuptake of serotonin, which is um, shortened as 5-HT, from the synaptic cleft, thereby increasing the amount of time that serotonin remains active. So that's just giving you some background about how SSRIs work if you weren't uh, familiar before. Elevated levels of serotonin within the synapse are associated with feelings of well-being. Conversely, low levels of serotonin are correlated with depressive symptoms. So that's a good sentence. Like if you weren't familiar with um, like the etiology of depression or the theories of it that you might want to put down. So increased serotonin equals happy, low serotonin equals sad, depressed. Recent studies have shown that SSRIs can also mediate their antidepressant effects by increasing brain levels of certain cytokines, including interferon gamma. Interferon gamma directly induces the expression of the protein P11 in neighboring neurons, which then interacts with 5-HTR4, a serotonin transmembrane receptor. So at this point, I'm going to stop. I'm going to flow chart a little bit because there, we just got introduced to like a couple more acronyms, and I want to make sure that I keep them all straight in my head. I'm going to put SSRIs, increase interferon gamma, and then I'm going to draw an arrow saying that interferon gamma is going to increase or induce the expression of P11, which then is going to have this interaction, and I usually put interactions as like a double-facing arrow. I love arrows in my flow charts, as you can probably tell, and I also love things like smiley faces and frowny faces. It just gets the point across. So it interacts with this serotonin um, transmembrane receptor. So we don't know much about this interaction yet, so I'm just going to leave it as there is an interaction, and once we figure out what it is, if we ever do, uh, then I will include that in my flowchart. So figures one and two provide in information about this interaction. Perfect. So figure interpretation. There's a ton of figures in this, so we're going to really rely on those figure interpretation skills that we went over in our figure interpretation video. So definitely go give that a watch if, you're, uh, if you struggle with figures. So first things first, read the um, figure caption. It says, uh, 5 HTR4 protein expression in plasma membrane enriched fraction of hippocampal lysate and in total hippocampal lysate from P11 wild type or P11 knockout mice. So now we have four groups. We have wild type that have P11 and we have knockout that do not have P11. Probably could have written that a little more succinctly. And then we have these two groups, uh, this plasma membrane enriched fraction. I don't really know what that means. I'm going to assume it means more plasma membrane is there. I don't know. I was never like a, a wet lab kind of gal or the uh, total hippocampal lysate. So I'm literally just going to assume this means more plasma membrane. I don't really know. And then I'm going to keep this total. I'm assuming that's sort of like the control. So I'm just going to kind of leave it as it is. It's total hippocampal lysate. So just a tiny bit of uh, figure interpretation we're going to say. Um, we're going to look at the uh, axes here. It says 5-HTR4 protein expression uh, as a percent of the wild type. So obviously the wild type, um, because we're doing percent of the wild type, then the wild type is by definition going to have 100%. Um, but the knockout mice that do not have P11, it looks like they're a little bit lower, but it's only significant in the ones that have increased plasma membrane. What does that mean? I don't know. It's less important that you, uh, in my opinion, that you really know what it means deep down and more important that you can extract that information uh, in the form of like the letters and the groups that, that the results belong to. So moving on to the next figure, it says effect of 5-HT on cyclic AMP levels in cells transfected with 5-HTR4 and or P11. So our axes say camp levels as a percent change from the control. And then we have control, ones that just got P11, ones that just got the receptor, and ones that got both. And you can see the significant change um, that the ones that got both the receptor and the protein um, have a lot more camp. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. P11 plus 5-HTR4 equals increased cyclic AMP. Again, I'm not really sure how that plays into the study um, at all, but we're going to roll with it. Studies have shown that analgesics such as ibuprofen inhibit the behavioral antidepressant responses normally observed in mice undergoing chronic SSRI administration. So that's interesting to me. 
So ibuprofen inhibits SSRI response. Figure three shows the effect of citalopram, an SSRI, and ibuprofen on interferon gamma expression in mice. So we're going back to that whole idea of interferon gamma kind of mediating some of this stuff. Figure four shows the effect of ibuprofen on P11 expression in the presence and absence of treatment with uh, citalopram. In both figures, VEH represents the group given the control so solution. So more figure interpretation. Effect of citalopram and ibuprofen on interferon gamma levels in the mouse frontal cortex. So we see interferon gamma levels on the y-axis and then um, all the different groups on the x-axis. So what do we see here? The big bar right here is with just citalopram. So citalopram increases interferon gamma. Now we can go back up and kind of peek and see what that means. If you're increasing interferon gamma, then you're going to increase your P11, which has an interaction with this uh, serotonin receptor. So maybe that's how this, this whole drug works. You notice that ibuprofen has kind of a weird effect. Like I like look how large this arrow bar is. It goes above and below kind of the control over here. And so I would not like, that's not like a significant, like ibuprofen doesn't have any obvious significant predictable effects on interferon gamma expression. That's what I get from that bar. And you notice that, you know, so Teleprim had this huge spike in interferon gamma, but when you add ibuprofen, you don't see any spike. You actually see like zero. So there are hypothesis up here that, Ibuprofen inhibits the expression of, you know, chronic SSRI administration. That is a true statement, but we already have that on our flow chart right here. It's just proven right here by the, by the figure. So now, now we're given a, another figure. Figure four says effect of ibuprofen on P11 expression in the brain in the presence and absence of citalopram treatment. Note for all graphs, data represented uh, as a mean plus or minus uh, SEM. And then we have our like typical indicators of uh, significance, but they kind of like changed it up for significance per, for the different uh, drugs that they're administering. That's kind of weird, but anyway, good to know. So VEH, remember that was our control condition and we're looking at P11 expression as a percent of the control. So it looks like um, on the X axis, we're given like VEH, which is control versus ibuprofen. So this is like, are they given ibuprofen or are they not? And then um, the black versus the gray bar is going to be like, are they given citalopram or are they not? So the black bar in the VEH condition would mean not given anything, complete like control. If they had no ibuprofen, so they're over here on the left side, but they were given citalopram, then they have a lot more P11 expression. So that, that tracks, right? Up here, we said uh, SSRIs increase your interferon gamma, which is going to increase your P11. So that is exactly what we saw in the passage. Now, if you were given um, ibuprofen and no citalopram, right? So that would be this black bar on the right side of the graph. Um, I, you likely, I like, can't tell that big of a difference. Like there's maybe a little bit of a significant difference right here between like um, the control. But that kind of goes back to like ibuprofen having these like relatively longer arrow bars. And so like, I, I'm not going to pull any like super significant difference between that, but you do see like a, an interesting difference because when you're given ibuprofen and citalopram, you actually have like significantly lower P11 expression than just with ibuprofen alone or, uh, just with citalopram alone. Needless to say, like all these graphs are kind of pointing us in the same direction and they're just reinforcing what the passage is saying. So that's why I say don't waste too, too much time on these uh, figures and everything, but make sure that they do like reinforce the ideas in the passage. So now we have a pretty good uh, flow chart and hopefully we understand what all these drugs, how they interact with the different proteins and then the receptors and all that stuff. All right. The first question, number 21 says, according to the data presented in the passage, 5-HGR4 is A, and they give us a bunch of different options for uh, different kinds of receptors. My light is about to go out, so it is flickering. I'm so sorry. So in my mind, like the first thing I was like, oh, it's like, it's transmembrane. So like, I just got to pick one that's transmembrane. Well, um, all of these are transmembrane, I'm pretty sure. So that's not going to help us. So you actually had to pick up on a really small detail in the passage. Um, but one that you maybe could have been thinking about when you read it. And hopefully this is why I say always read your figure captions because they will put answers in there. And that's exactly what they did here. This is like one of the only places where they mention cyclic AMP. So, um, in the figure caption of figure two, we see that, um, there's an increase in cyclic AMP levels when you have this transmembrane receptor there. 
So we know that the transmembrane receptor has something to do with cyclic AMP. And which of the receptors do we know has something to do with cyclic AMP? You guys should know pretty well the ins and outs of a G protein coupled receptor and know um, its downstream effects. I think that's like the only receptor that you really have to know that kind of downstream effect, but you do kind of have to know step by step. You'll learn later on like the different types of G protein coupled receptors, and they don't always increase cyclic AMP, but um, for the MCAT sake, you are always going to associate GPCRs with an increase in cyclic AMP um, and an increase in adenylate cyclase and um, all that kind of downstream stuff. So like literally uh, picking up on that cyclic AMP thing in the figure caption was like the only way to get that question right. So um, sometimes those little details matter. The next question, number 22, says uh, serotonin is synthesized from a single amino acid by a short metabolic pathway consisting of a hydroxylation reaction followed by a decarboxylation reaction. The chemical structure of serotonin is shown. And then it asks which amino acid is uh, from which amino acid is serotonin synthesized. So not sure. Some, some people will know this just straight up where serotonin comes from. Um, but if you don't, you could kind of look at this figure and say, well, which amino acid does it look like? And if you still couldn't get it from that, or if you didn't feel confident from it, you could follow these, um, different kind of reactions and work backwards to say, well, if there was a decarboxylation reaction, I know that a CO2 came off. And so like, where would the CO2 be? And that kind of thing. And you could actually like trace it back to an amino acid. But honestly, if you guys see this double ring structure, like rings are like kind of complicated to make. And so if you see this double ring structure and you see down here, we got this, um, like this is probably where the backbone of the amino acid was connected. It probably had its little, um, you know, it's carboxylic acid or whatever, um, over here. And if you see this double ring structure, you can pretty well say that it came from tryptophan, but that, um, maybe it would just be an easy one to kind of keep in the back of your mind that serotonin comes from tryptophan. I think, uh, I think melatonin also comes from tryptophan too, but moral of the story, you can kind of look at this structure and say, okay, there's a double ring and it's got an N inside one of the rings. And so like it's giving tryptophan definitely know the structures of all these. Um, it would take a lot to get to proline here. You'd have to add like this whole structure over here. Tyrosine, it would also take a lot because you'd have to like add this thing in the middle. And histidine is kind of the same story as proline. Like you would have to, for one, there's another nitrogen in uh, histidine and you would have to add on this whole ring. Whereas with tryptophan, it's kind of looks like tryptophan anyway. You just have to like take off, like you'd have to hydroxylate it, which is what they did here. And then you'd have to take off the uh, carbon dioxide, which is what they did when they, um, you know, took off this carboxylic acid end of it. Those are common question stems, so definitely be comfortable with amino acids. If I could give you any advice, it'd be, be comfortable with amino acids. In an experiment in which ibuprofen alone was administered to normal mice in order to determine whether long-term treatment with NOGs it can cause behavioral symptoms of depression, what would be the appropriate control group? So they're asking a research question in biobiochem. That's illegal. Flag on the play. Is that the saying? I'm trying to be like more sporty recently, but I don't really know if that's the saying. Okay, so what do they want to do? They want to see if ibuprofen alone to normal mice causes depression. So ibuprofen equal depressed. Or er, let's go back to my roots, frowning face. So what would be the appropriate control group? I want you guys to think about this and be able to pick this without looking at the answer choices. Because if you can save a little bit of time on these questions like this, that once you get the hang of them, they're pretty easy, then you guys will not be like as pressed for time, which is a huge thing. The time constraint on the MCAT is insane. So if this is our experiment group, we're giving ibuprofen to normal mice, what would be the control group? Definitely normal mice, right? You can kind of glance over here and see they're trying to cut the cake between normal and depressed mice, and then they're trying to see what you want to give them. So we definitely want to use normal mice. And do we want to give them anything? No, right? Because this is a control group. So we want to give them, you know, given nothing. Go off king. Give us nothing. Or a placebo in this case. Placebo is actually going to be a better option. 
But anyway, which answer choice is that? That would be answer choice number C. Let's go through all the other ones and see why they're wrong. So A says normal mice. We definitely do want to use normal mice, right? Because they're using normal mice here. But treated with an SSRI, we don't want to give them anything, obviously, because the SSRI is going to confound the results. It's going to give us... Um, it's going to give us results that we don't know if they're due to the ibuprofen or not. Like that difference that we see, is it due to the ibuprofen or is it due to the SSRI? And then B and D are both wrong because one, you're giving them random stuff. And then um, you don't want to use depressed mice. And that makes me sad to think about depressed mice. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to give that to them because we're trying to see if these normal mice will get depression from ibuprofen. So we don't want to use mice that are already depressed as a control group because then we can't see, like, if the control group also, like, over the course of time, just because the economy sucks or whatever, they develop depression, then we would know that, like, it's not the ibuprofen that's doing it. That's what we want to do. We want to only change one thing in the experimental group and the control group keeps everything else exactly the same, um, except they don't have that experimental variable. And in, in this case, it's ibuprofen. And so you don't want to have depressed mice that introduces a new variable and it kind of just Fs up the whole study. So the last question says, which comparison best determines whether interferon gamma is necessary for antidepressant induced increases in the expression of P11? So this is another um, expression levels of P11 in blah, blah, blah. So let's break this question down. They want to know whether interferon gamma is necessary for antidepressant inducing increases in P11. So SSRIs, which are antidepressants, increase P11. That's something that we know from the passage. They want to know whether interferon gamma is necessary for that. So they want to know kind of a mediation reaction. Is interferon gamma that important for this relationship? So what do we need to know in this case? So kind of, I guess what they're asking is what would be the groups, both control and experimental. Again, this is one of those things that I want you to come up with the answer before you look at the answer choices. So obviously we're going to have this relationship where they kind of have all of it. We're giving them SSRIs and we're seeing if it increases the P11, but I guess the groups would need to be one of them has interferon gamma and then one of them does not. That would be, that's since that's the variable we are wondering about, that's the one that we want to have in one group and knock out in the other group. So we want wild type mice, let's go through these answer choices, versus interferon knockout mice, that makes sense, right? Both treated with P11. So that's backwards, right? We want to know if SSRIs induce increases in P11. So SSRIs are given before we see an increase in P11, and we're not actually giving P11, we're seeing if it increases it in their you know, brains or whatever. So that one's not right because we're it's giving the wrong protein molecule. So B says wild type mice versus interferon knockout mice. So that's perfect. Both treated with an SSRI. Perfect. Then we can see if they're both given an SSRI and then we see their P11 expression levels, one of them has interferon gamma and say that they have plenty of P11. If the interferon gamma knockout mice don't have any P11, then we know that interferon gamma is important for this relationship. If the interferon gamma knockout mice still produce a P11 in response to an SSRI, then we know that interferon gamma is not important to that relationship. So that is what B is saying. Wild type mice treated with interferon gamma versus wild type mice treated with an SSRI. So we definitely want to give an SSRI to both groups, right? Because we are trying to see if SSRIs increase P11. Um, and we're just like the whole point of the study is does interferon gamma matter? So that's not going to be right. Wild type mice treated with interferon gamma versus wild type mice treated with ibuprofen. So ibuprofen doesn't have anything to do with this. Uh, with this, that's kind of like uh, name dropping, where they take something that was commonly named in the passage and they just name drop it in the answer choice to hope that you pick it just because it was overrepresented in the passage, but it doesn't actually answer the question. So B is the correct answer in there. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that passage breakdown. I know I did. There was a lot of research method questions, which I love. If you guys don't mind, if you enjoyed anything in the video, please hit like and subscribe and make sure to check out the description below. We have tons of new projects all the time. We have a website, we have a Discord channel, and make sure to keep up with us on all those platforms. Comment down below what you want to see next, and until next time.